Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my Friday message. My special guest this week is David Page, Professor and Chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics and Professor of Computer Science. Artificial intelligence and machine learning have been very much in the news lately, and both are playing increasingly prominent roles in healthcare. David is here to talk to us about the advantages as well as the potential downside of AI and machine learning and about how the School of Medicine is working to maximize the opportunities and minimize the risks. It's a fascinating and timely topic and I will look forward to hearing more about it, all of this. Before we talk to David, I'd like to share a few updates. On March 1st, Dr. Li Zhou joined us as the new chair of the Department of Pharmacology and Cancer Biology. Dr. Zhou comes to Duke from Harvard Medical School, where he held an endowed chair in cancer research and was co-leader of the Cancer Cell Biology Program of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. He's going to be a great leader for us, and I know you join me to welcoming Dr. Zhou at Duke. I also want to thank Dr. Colin Duckett for his exceptional leadership as the interim chair, and Scott Soderling for leading the search committee. The Food and Drug Administration last month approved the first ever treatment for devastating eye disease called geographic atrophy based on clinical trials conducted here at Duke. Dr. Eleanor Ladd in our Department of Ophthalmology was the lead investigator on the study, which demonstrated the effectiveness of pexatocoplin in treating the disease geographic atrophy and can lead to permanent vision loss. The new drug is the first safe and effective treatment for these patients. Last week, the School of Medicine and the Office of Biomedical Graduate Education presented the Chancellor's Awards for Research Excellence to five outstanding doctoral students conducting innovative basic research. Brooke Darcy, Rebecca Gibson, Pierre Rodriguez, Molly Sweeney, and Sebastian Welford were honored for their achievements in areas including brain health and the development of infectious diseases, gene therapies, and other diseases. They and the other nominees represent the future of biomedical research, and I'm excited to see what they accomplish in the years ahead. Finally, I want to remind you that the Dean's Distinguished Research continues this month and into April. We opened the series on February 23rd with the annual Robert J. Lefkowitz Distinguished Lecture, featuring a fantastic talk by Titia DeLonga of Rockefeller University. Remaining sessions are on March 30th and April 20th, and will include faculty lectures and trainee poster sessions. I encourage you to attend and hear about some of the outstanding science your colleagues are doing. And now, please join me in welcoming David Page. Welcome, David. Thank you. So first of all, let's just get some terminology straight. What's the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? So historically, machine learning is one area of artificial intelligence. And machine learning deals with really the computer finding patterns in data, much like a human would, and especially building predictive models. So for example, the computer might look at electronic health record data and socioeconomic data and build a model to predict stroke risk. Uh, it could build this model based on lots of other people's data and then predict, for me, based on my data, my risk for the next year. Artificial intelligence includes a wide variety of other tasks. So example tasks include natural language processing, such as machine translation, or sentiment analysis. Is this person writing in favor or against this particular company? Uh, but it also includes game playing, chess and Go and video games, and it includes computer vision. So does this image contain a cat or not is a popular one on the internet now. Uh, the big change recently is that almost all of these AI tasks are best accomplished by machine learning, and so they've become more or less synonymous now. Okay. So David, ChatGPT has hit the the news recently, and it seems like it came out of nowhere, but obviously didn't. Can you explain a little bit what it is and why is it here? Yes, it is built on a long line of research with building probabilistic models, models that will provide probabilities from data, from large amounts of data, in this case, text data. And not only can these models tell you the probability that a certain word will come next in a sentence, they can generate that word. And so generate a whole sentence, a whole dialogue, a whole book, even. A whole essay, a whole that, book. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and so um, these models seem to have come out of nowhere, but the work on these kinds of models has gone on for 50 years. Most recently, the kinds of probabilistic models we use are neural networks 
And neural networks are much faster than these other models were historically, which lets us build progressively more complex architectures. The real benefit of these complex architectures and complex techniques is that we don't just look at the last word when we predict the next word. We can look at the whole sentence that we're in. We can look at the entire dialogue or book so far and pay attention in, in a way to everything, everywhere, all at once in this book or dialogue. And that's what makes it uh, almost look magical now. So David, these are really powerful tools, but there are also risks involved. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think it's important for us to remember these tools are still very imperfect and still under development. So one of the risks that we see now with ChatGPT is kind of like the old risks that we saw early on with search and still continues. Uh, if I search on my symptoms today, I may find some rare disease and by the time I'm through searching, I'm convinced that I have it. That kind of rabbit hole is, uh, is on steroids now with ChatGPT and these other chatbots. And so what we see is because the transformer model looks at our whole dialogue so far, if I start getting worried or negative, uh, it's just going to play off of that and that's going to influence where it goes. And at some point, most of the dialogue is negative and that's all it has to attend to and, uh, and will really reinforce my worries and emotional state. So David, the field is evolving very fast. Can you predict what the next big breakthrough is going to be? I think the next big question we have to answer is, uh, is how do we make these neural networks accurate at causal inferences? So right now they're doing prediction, predicting the next word, generating the next word. But most of the time we care deeply about what's causing that prediction and especially how could we change that outcome. In the clinic we care about that, in our daily lives we care about that. And so my big interest now, and I think that of many others, is can we make these neural networks more causally accurate? Can they tell us not just what's going to happen, but how we can change it, or the counterfactual? How would the outcome be different if we take a different action now? What I'm really excited about, David, is the role of our faculty in the School of Medicine in really advancing some of the opportunities and also studying and defining some of the risks. Can you talk a little bit about that work here? Absolutely. So Duke is one of the leading places, including Michael Pensino's work, at evaluating these predictive models before and after they're translated into the clinic. And that's really critical. We have to be skeptical and evaluate carefully what the patient outcomes will be. But we also have to be really creative and, and develop the best models, the best algorithms that we can. And it's very exciting, the opportunity to take all these different data sources the electronic health records, the socioeconomic factors, all the information that's available about patients and use that to do a better job of predicting outcomes and also a better job of predicting alternative outcomes under different decisions. So thank you, David, for joining me today and thanks to all, all of you for all the work that you do and have a great weekend.